All right. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salawat wa salam ala rasulullah wa alihi wa sahbihi wa min wala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear brothers and sisters, welcome to our second session in this journey into Imam Ghazali's life and work, subhanAllah. It's such an honor to have this journey with all of you, honestly. Like, I'm always excited for this session. And it will be a long journey, by the way. So, inshallah, we'll see when Allah will permit us to end the journey, but perhaps never, perhaps soon, Allah Alam. But we will continue. Uh, as always, feel free to change your names on the Zoom chat and add your country of origin. It's always beautiful to see that we're an international diverse movement with brothers and sisters from all over the world. This uh, halaqa uh, will be led by Dr. Mubarak, our beloved uh, brother and doctor and, and, and scholar and also servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from Singapore. And we will, uh, inshallah, under his excellent leadership, uh, go through both the biography of Imam Ghazali, as we mentioned last, last month, and also the Ihya after a while, inshallah. Um, I am Sayyid Jamaluddin Miri. For all of you who do not know me, I'm a co-founder and director of ISIP, International Students of Islamic Psychology. And together with Brother Mubarak, we have been colleagues and also classmates at the Cambridge Muslim College. We did our diploma in Islamic Psychology there last year, alhamdulillah. So I will be at service for Dr. Mubarak and also for all of you as both facilitator and also uh, reflection. So I will try to reflect upon the works with Dr. Mubarak from a psychological point of view and see which nasiha we can extract from the works and the biography of Imam Ghazali, rahimullah. There's so much nasiha, so much profound things that we can utilize. Many of our members, brothers and sisters, all of you are mental health professionals. Some of you are scholars. Some of you are students. We are all students, by the way. So we're all students. So uh, you guys will also be able, with your expertise and experience, which we're so honored to have with us, be part of the discussion. So we will allow you to both unmute yourself, write in the Zoom chat. So this is active halaqa. All of you are in, 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 equally important to for all of us to extract knowledge from, from the readings uh, with Dr. Mubarak, who has profound knowledge in this. I also want to thank, before we start, Sister Sema. Sister Sema is the task force facilitator and project coordinator for this task force of halaqa of Imam Ghazali. She's the one who emails you all with the link, and she's the one who updates on the Zoom, uh, WhatsApp group. So thank you so much, Sister Sema, for your excellent service. And we pray that, because she's from Turkey as well, we know that our brothers and sisters are suffering in Turkey right now because of the earthquakes. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for all of our beloved brothers and sisters there. We're always at your service, inshallah. So thank you, Sister Sema, for your excellent work. Also, Sister Ismat, our International Secretary of ISIP, she's here to, today as well. Thank you, Sister, for your amazing work as well. All right, without any further ado, uh, we will welcome now Dr. Mubarak to, to take over, inshallah. Jazakallah khaira. Welcome, brother. Thank you very much, Brother Jamaluddin. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Qala rabbi shrah li sadri wa yasir li amri wa ahlul u'adatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Qalu subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma'alam tana innaka anta al-alim al-hakim. Masha'Allah hakanu ma'alam masha'alam yakun ilahi anta maksudi wa radaka matlubi a'atini mahabbataka wa ma'arifataka. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. May peace and blessings be upon all of you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever that you are. Thank you very much uh, for spending uh, some of your time today uh, on a Sunday or probably or still on a Saturday uh, for some of you uh, in this uh, journey with Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali. As how Brother Jamaluddin has mentioned is that... Um, we are all together in this journey, um, uh, in this sohbah, uh, in this spiritual companionship that we have among uh, one of uh, together down here uh, by reading the, the works of Imam Abu Hamid Al Ghazali. He is bringing us all together from all over the world in order for us to, to read and for us to study from the brilliance of a servant of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, the Khadam of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who has been a very wise person right, within our Islamic intellectual tradition. Let me know how much contribution that Abu, Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali has given to the Islamic civilization, to all of us in the past, in the present, and probably also in the future. So therefore, all, right, all of us together here is within this sohbah that each and every one of us bring in our experience, bringing our knowledge uh, to this circle, to this halaqah for us to be able 
to understand and to interpret and to make to take some wise advice from Imam Abu Hamid Al Ghazali. Why Imam Abu Hamid Al Ghazali, which I have described in the previous session, is because of Imam Abu Hamid Al Ghazali. One of the things about unique about the wisdom, uh, the scholarship of Imam Abu Hamid Al Ghazali is that Imam Abu Hamid Al Ghazali speaks from a very universal perspective. Whatever that he mentioned, whatever that he talks about, has its relevance even up to our contemporary time. So, in terms of the impact, in terms of the influence of the thoughts of Imam Abu Hamid Al Ghazali, it is very profound as how the Ghazalian scholars of the past and of the present uh, has uh, described him, has also uh, uh, provided uh, research on him and many of all the other works that comes about after the time of Imam Abu Hamid Al Ghazali are basically taking the foundation from his writings. So therefore, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet has given us this opportunity for us to be together, to be brought together all right, in this unified halaqah uh, to have this spiritual companionship among one, uh, among one another in our uh, true Imam Abu Hamid Al-Ghazali. So therefore, this halaqah is a very dynamic halaqah. Everyone is able to participate. Everyone is able to provide their insights. Right? As we know that there are scholars here, there are clinicians here, there are students here, there are many more people uh, who are very more qualified in understanding the thoughts of Imam Abu Hamid Al-Ghazali. Our role, myself and Brother Sayyid Jamaluddin, right, is to facilitate these discussions. Probably, all right, we will raise even more questions in order for us to understand and to dive deep into some of these areas, all right, the areas of psychology and especially from the perspective of Islam. And when we talk about from the perspective of Islam and we apply it to psychology, all right, a very fundamental difference between what we see psychology has as the science of Almu and Nafs. Uh, Almu and Nafs is that the human being is made up of Nafs, uh, Akal, Qal, and Roh. These are the basic four components, and all these four components, uh, we would say that is embodied and unified within the jasad of the human being who is living in this terrestrial world as a journey for us to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the afterlife. So the way on how when we talk about it from a psychological perspective, an Islamic psychological perspective, these are the quote, total component of the human being that we are looking at and we want to analyze, we want to understand what are some of the basic principles or fundamental first principles that Imam Abu Hamid Al-Ghazali can provide us in order for us to be able to re-establish, for us to re revitalize, for us to be able to provide the gaps of knowledge that current psychology has, right, where Islam is able to come in and fill up and also integrate and synthesize it in order for us to be able to help humanity go through this contemporary world, inshallah. So with that, inshallah, we will continue with our, our, our journey today. And let us first start off all right, by putting in our correct niyat, all right, our intention uh, for us to come together in this sohbah, all right, first and foremost, to have obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet, and for us to be able to serve humanity Right, in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet. We read Al-Fatiha with the intention to give and to receive benefits, to teach and to learn, to follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Zahir and Baltin, and with the, intention, with the intention to cooperate, work together and assist one another in Islam and in adhering to the sharia of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah grant us complete determination and diligence in seeking beneficial knowledge, able to perform good deeds with sincerity and longevity, in obedience to him, a good ending during the time of death. Al-Fatiha bin Yadi Nafi wa Tifaq wa Ta'lum wa Ta'lim wa Al-Iqtida' bin Nabi Al-Makhtar bi Sirri wa Al-Ijhar wa Bi Niyati Tanasuri wa Ta'awuni wa Ta'aduri ala al-Din wa Iqamati Shari'at al-Sayyidi al-Mursaleen wa Anna Allah yarukamal al-Nashar wa al-Hamma wa Jiddi wa al-Ishtihad fi talab al-Alum al-Nafi'a wa Amali biha ma la akhlas wa waltul umri fi ta'ati Allah wa khusni al-Khatimata inda al-Mut wa ila hadrati Nabi Sayyidina Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم الفاتحة 
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين الله حاضر الله ناظر الله شاهد عليا الله معي الله معيني وهو بكل شيء مهل رب زدني علما وارزقني فحما برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين صلى الله على خير خلق سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين الحمد لله رب العالمين وبالإسناد المتصل إلى الإمام أبو حامد بن محمد بن محمد بن محمد بن أحمد التوسي الغزالي رحم الله عليه ونفعنا في درين آمين رضي الله عنكم أما بعد Alright, for our outline today, inshallah, alright, we'll first part of it, we will revisit the narrations. We revisit the narrations that we have read last week. Uh, for those of you uh, who have registered, you have already received the package, the PDF copy of the book, alright, or, or the link, alright, for you to be able to buy, to purchase the hard copy of Munkith Minat Dalala, uh, the translation by uh, our brother uh, Mokhtar Khalan. All right, uh, you have uh, purchased it. All right, uh, so we will be revisiting the narration that we read from page one up to page four, which is the introduction. All right, of Imam Abu Hamid Al Ghazali as to why he wrote uh, Munkith Al Minat Dalala. So in revisiting this, there are three aspects that we would like to look: the criteria of certain knowledge that Imam Al Ghazali provided in the text itself, and then the difference in the idea of taklid and taklidats. Okay, that we mentioned slightly last week, okay, but we didn't go into detail. We would just like to look at it all right, a bit more and how these two are connected to psychology of youth. Why was it on the psychology of youth that we were focusing on? Because the introduction that Imam Abu Hamid Al-Ghazali writes this book is he introduced it when he says that at his youth, as his prime time of his youth, these were the things that he was going through. So therefore, it Somehow or another, we context it all right, to the idea where Imam Al-Ghazali is providing us an insight to him as a youth at that period of time, right, the kind of uh, uh, disequilibrium all right, or imbalances that he was undergoing, all right, being a, even already a scholar of that period of time, all right, that those kind of imbalances, how was he able to overcome it? And hopefully, by looking at it from the perspective of youth psychology, it gives us some insight on how we could understand our youth at current at, at present times and help us in the development of the field of youth <coughs> psychology uh, and help us uh, in, in, in guiding our youth within whichever uh, countries that we are in. And then we will, next part, we will read the text, uh, the next part of the text, which is on page 5 to page 8, okay, as how we have mentioned in the uh, lesson outline that we have provided. And then we will discuss some of the points raised by Imam Muhammad Al-Ghazali that comes from page 5 to 8 uh, in relation to youth psychology. Now, these discussions, this revisiting and all that, all right, you are welcome all right, to raise your hand. You are welcome to put in your comments all right, in the chat box. All right, other further insights that you have all right, when you are reading it, you are welcome all right, uh, to raise your hand and also all right, to do your reflection and share with all of us, inshallah. All right, so the revisiting of the narrations okay, from page one to page four okay, of the book all right, is the criteria of certain knowledge that Imam Muhammad Al-Ghazali provided all right, when uh, he was talking about it. So when he was talking about the criteria of certain knowledge, which is Ilmul Yakin, right? Ilmul Yakin in the perspective of a youth at that age of 20 years old. Okay. So we cannot talk about it from a perspective of a the the uh, what is the hierarchy of Yakin, right? From the perspective of the Sufi terminologies. Here we are looking at it from a youth, right? which is right, at the age of 20 years old, how he understand what it means by all right, certain knowledge, right? So the object of knowledge is made so manifest that no doubt clinch to it. No possibilities of error and deception to accompany the knowledge obtained. The mind cannot even think of the possibility of error and deception. 
Now the term mind is a translation. The Arabic term that was used is qal. Right? The Arabic term that Imam Al-Ghazali uses right, in putting in this criteria was the qal. Right? So the qal does not even entertain the possibility of error and deception right? when the knowledge reaches this level of certainty. Now, knowledge must be infallible or secure from error. When challenged by the demonstration of falsehood, the knowledge still stands. So he mentioned about that all right, on page number three, right at the bottom down there. Right? Since I know that 10 is more than three, even if someone said to me, no, three is more as proven by my turning this stuff into serpent. And if he did transform it, and I witnessed it, this doing so, I would not doubt my knowledge on his account. I would simply experience amazement at the nature of his ability to perform such a feat. But as for doubting what I knew, I would entertain no such doubt. So that kind of certainty, right, of kaitira, certainty of knowledge that Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali wants to reach at that. All right? So this is a quest that Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali right, was talking about. Right? At that age, he has this thirst. This thirst of quenching, all right, that, 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 uh, quenching the thirst of certainty. Uh, quenching the thirst of certainty. Now, in order to quench that certainty, all right, he mentioned about taklid and taklidats. All right? These two uh, differentiation. Uh, he mentioned all right, a, a couple of times all right, within the text all right, that uh, he was, I will not say interrogating, but he was trying to break free, right, report a taklid, right, trying to break free all right, from the methodological uh, implication of taklid. And then he mentions also all right, within the text that... Uh, uh, where was it inside the text? It's somewhere on page 3 of the text. Right? The thirst for attaining the true facts, haqa ikul umur, has always been my custom and my practice from the start of my career and the prime of my life. It is an instinct, uh, uh, ariza, and a disposition, fitra, installed in my nature by Allah, not by my own choice and design. As a result, the bond of convention, uh, ribat a taklid, was detached from me and the ties of heredity, hereditary dogmas, al-aqa'idul ma'afu, uh, what is this? Uh, dogmas that are passed down through customs were broken off me around the time of the regal of youth. I noticed that the young Christian had no pattern of growth except in accordance with Christianity, while the young Jews had no pattern of growth except in accordance to Judaism, and the young Muslim had no pattern of growth except in accordance with Islam. So this, this breaking himself away right, from taklid and taklidat. But the beautiful thing about Imam Al-Ghazali is that he went on to mention about my inner being was thereby moved towards the reality of original nature. Hakikatul fitriya al-asliya and the reality of beliefs. Hakikatul aqa'id we at variance with the conventionality of parents and teachers. I learned to discriminate between these conventions, right? These conventions, the, con the, the translation of conventions here are taklidats. Okay, the most important of which are doctrinal teaching. So here, Imam Al-Ghazali's rejection of taklid stem from his methodological criticism of the limitation inherent in taklid, meaning that the taklidats, right, in itself, it can be true or false. But his acceptance of taklid is his affirmation of the variance in a human intellectual capacity, which means that his acceptance of taklidat that are true in of itself in matters of doctrinal teachings. So he knows where to position this whole methodology of taklid okay, and the taklidat. So the taklidat are the results of the method of taklid. Taklid is following authority. 
So therefore, there, there has a methodology for him that you could end up in true and false. So therefore, you need to be able to differentiate between the truth and the falsehoods. Huh? So he was able to do that okay, when he uh, freed himself from the bondage of this methodology. Now, this is something which is very interesting. Okay, when we look at how youths, okay, when we look at how youths go through their life and trying to look for their identity, they start to question things. But then, how does that questioning of, of things around them, beliefs around them, beliefs that are inherited through cultural practices, right? Things that are inherited through cultural practices. They are able to differentiate it between the doctrines <laughs> itself that are true in itself because it is coming directly from Wahyi and those that has the human interpretation that are more influenced to cultural. So at that part, this part of the paragraph that Imam Al-Ghazali brings in, it gives us a, uh, an insight to the mind and, and to the heart where probably most of us were also youth. And when we were youths, we start, we do questions. Uh, we do question a lot of things. And that is why, right at the very beginning, I mentioned that uh, there is this component of universality of what Imam Al-Ghazali writes, because he goes to the, to the general nature of the human being, of youth at that particular age. What are the kind of dilemma what are the kind of tussle that is happening inside of them? Right? Inside of them. So if you look at, all right, these were the, the, the same slides that was used all right, in the previous session where we put in all right, the fundamentals principle of youth psychology, the internal factors, which is the, dis, the fitric disposition of youth, which is the quest towards certainty of things. Haka ikul umur. The potentiality towards actuality. How is that fit trick? Probably each one of the youth, in terms of its level of intellectuality, is definitely not at the level of Imam Muhammad al Ghazali. But the fit trick disposition of wanting to know the certainty of things. Right? And how much is that covered due to external factors and whatever that they have been exposed? Does those coverings how do we help them navigate those coverings of that fitric self that they have? And then positive doubts towards other types of doubt. What does shak, the doubt that Imam Al-Ghazali infused in, all right, as compared to the doubt that brings towards relativism yeah, within the framework of contemporary? Now, external factors that affected Imam Al-Ghazali, which are also relevant to us, are the intellectual and religious environments that a youth has been in and exposed to, right? That definitely plays a lot of part, right, in that covering of the fitric self. The discourses on claims of truth and the impact of monopolizing truth within Islam. So that is that those were external factors affecting Imam Al Ghazali at that point of time, because he was navigating the various schools, knowing what was happening around. Is that still the same for our youth now? Right, living in the different cultures that we are in, right? the kind of narrations they are getting within Islam, right? within Islam that has its cultural impact, that has its cultural influence, that is claiming to be truth or, or more true than the other interpretations of some other right, uh, cultures that has brought Islam within right, the social, right, the political environment that they are living in. Now, but Imam Al-Ghazali, what makes it difficult for us now as compared to the time of Imam Al-Ghazali was that the predominant worldview at the time of Imam Al-Ghazali where he lives, where he grew up, where he experienced his youth in Tuz and in Nishapur was an environment of an Islamic worldview. An Islamic environment where the thoughts are Islamic thoughts. That was the governing principle. But now we are faced with, our youth are faced with non 
religious claims of relative truths. So in, in, in terms of the challenges, our youth are even facing more challenged because they have this so-called monopolizing of truth by certain fraction and sect within Islam or within in a particular school of thought, but different cultural manifestations of it. And then you have the religious, the non-religious one that is coming in and also haunting our youth. So therefore, that fitric disposition of the youth in wanting to know certain, to, in wanting to arrive at certainty of things at that age, at their age, certainty which is capable of that age. Because here Imam Al-Ghazali will tell us in the next chapter, all right, about the, the other faculty that is above the rational faculty at that point, at that age, is still yet to be developed in order for it to be able to be able to arrive at a higher level of certainty. But the acknowledgement that this higher faculty is there and how that tussle happens all right, within all right, himself and what more about our youth. Right? So those are the external factors. All right, it's comparison and it's parallel to our current world all right, as we were reading uh, last week, the introduction. And then there's what, and then we talk a bit about this, the spiritual education is appropriate for children, youth within the various age group. The immediate family as the first educational institute for young children, which we will look at it again after we read right, page 5 to page 8. And I mentioned about the relationship and recognizing and developing the capacity of the heart as an intellectual faculty that is capable of reaching higher levels of truth and certainties as age increases. Right? Because as we go on in, 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 in Mumun Kith, as Imam Ghazali described his intellectual and spiritual journey, that higher faculty develops. And when that higher faculty develops, it requires a different kind of nourishment in order for it to be able to attain the kind of certainty or quenches its thirst. When he was young, in chapter 1, the introduction, and chapter 2, uh, the introduction and chapter 1 that we're going to read today, a certain level of thirst that he has and requires all right, the quenching of that thirst, all right, uh, a, a certain form of quenching, all right, nourishment that it requires. So some questions to ponder in relation to last week and also in the coming. What was the identity that Imam Ghazali was searching in his youth? Is that identity universal to all youths or particular to Imam Al-Ghazali? How are the criteria for certain knowledge given by Imam Al-Ghazali able to provide rootedness to youth in their psychological development? How does Imam al-Ghazali able to discriminate between taqidats that are fundamental to the religion and those that are based upon parents and teachers? To what extent does the practices, ritual of Islam practiced by children at a young age helps in provided, providing the rootedness for them as they grow to become youth and as yes, they explore their identity? How does jurisprudential psychology nurtures the psychology of children in preparing them for adolescence and the journey of discovery that awaits? How does the family institution play its role in this development? I would like to open up discussion all right, based on these questions. Okay. Uh, Brother Zaid Jamaluddin, you want Mashallah. to? Yeah. My beloved brother, Dr. Mubarak, I was just reflecting and feel free, dear brothers and sisters, to raise your digital hands or write in the chat. There is already a question in the chat from Nahar. Um, I was thinking about the previous slide when we were when you were speaking about our natural disposition towards knowledge and quiety, and also uh, the aspect of our fitric disposition. You were also speaking about even back in Imam Ghazali's days, Rahimullah. Uh, it was some challenges, but as you say, Nishapur and Tus was uh, cities and regions of the Muslim world where the dominative narrative and the ontological reality of the society was based upon an Islamic worldview, which is not the case for many people today, even in Muslim countries, honestly, brothers and sisters. I think that that's the case even in Muslim countries because through secularization, modernity, uh, also through nationalism and all these you know, non-fitri ideologies, we have been disconnected to this worldview and this worldview nourished the 
the, the fitra, uh, engage the fitra to be reconnected uh, yeah. or engage us to be reconnected to fitra, I should say. So the whole society was a fitri society in a sense, even though Imam Ghazali they would all write, criticize even what, um, his times and people of his times for being too mechanistic when it came to um, uh, approaching uh, health or approaching uh, terbiya or approaching even psychology. Um, and I was thinking also about uh, the socialization mechanism of modernity is much uh, disconnected to Tawheed, right? So our youths, our children come to the dunya being in a disposition of being close to fitra and to witnessing and feeling that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine names and attributes and his presence and the knowledge that comes with that. And then as they grow up in dunya, they, be dis they become more and more disconnected through socialization, through socialization. And socialization is connection to parents, connection to friends. And the children is uh, projecting uh, its longing towards reconnecting to fitra by trying to find the perfect love in this mortal objects, whether it's parents or friends or, you know, it could be even TikTok, honestly. I'm taking TikTok as an example because that's what the children today is looking for, to, 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 connect, to create connectiveness, uh, which is sad in a sense. Not to say that uh, digitalization is not good, but it's not, we should be there uh, guiding our children to fit the environments through those medias. But I digress. So this socialization mechanism disconnect the children from the perfect love, which is to be connected to fitra and to the uh, and to tawhid, right? Which is the essential knowledge that is inscribed in our fitra as an imprint on our soul. And these socialization mechanism of our days are a little bit different than Imam Ghazali's days. But nevertheless, I do think that by pondering about what Imam Ghazali pondered in his works, we can take and extract a lot of lot of nasiya that we could implement in this day and age. For instance, how can we help our children to reconnect to fitra by true fitri knowledge inquiry? Uh, Brother Dr. Mubarak mentions that taqlid and taqlid ghat, actually Imam Ghazali is not against taqlid either, but it needs to be guided, right? So how do we work with that guided taqlid? You know, can we even do that in those spaces that our children and youths are engaging today, whether it's TikTok, whether it's popular culture, whether it's on the streets, whatever? How can we be there? You know, because the social socialization faces that disconnects our youths to be connected to the fitra is very strong today. And even though we might disconnect them from all of it, we will not be successful. It's too strong. The market is too strong. The influences are too strong. So how can we act upon that? Because um, these socialization mechanism of blurring our children and our youths from actually being in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be connected to the fitra. So I would add into the discussion uh, as we ponder, how do we understand the socialization mechanism of this day and age? How can we psychologically and through tarbiyah um, uh, take away the blur that the socialization mechanism are creating for our youths, but also for ourselves, by the way, as adults. This is not only for the youths. This is reminders for ourselves as adults as well, so that we all can be reconnected to fitra. And how do we understand what is proper taqlid and what is not proper taqlid? And how can we engage our youths to actually engage in critical thinking that is rooted in the Quran and the Sunnah, of course? So critical thinking could be good, but critical thinking could be bad as well, because if critical thinking is, is connected to atheism, which also has a critical thinking of thinking about religion, then that will actually not allow our children to reconnect to fitra. The opposite, it will deviate them, which is the essence of empirical critical thinking from the Western narrative. What our children are taught in schools, at least in West, I'm sure even in many non-Western countries, is critical thinking from the basic of another ontological reality than the one that Imam Ghazali was um, in, li lived in during his time in Nishapur and Tuz. So these are the things that I think we can also add to the reflections. And yes, please, Sister Saba, you raise your hand. Feel free to reflect uh, upon these uh, questions and also what we discussed right now. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Can you hear me, brother? Yes, we hear you. Um, I was thinking, uh, just a reflection, not a question in particular. I was thinking about... Um, I was thinking about the subject from the point of view of a parent and supporting our children throughout um, 
because with a parent, you, you tend to have the ability to be connected to your children over a longer period of time. So based on what um, uh, Imam Ghazali says about how youth are more functional in terms of um, their intellect during the time of youth, um, perhaps what are your thoughts on appealing to intellect? Because a lot of scholars have done a lot of research, a lot of research in terms of how Islamic um, knowledge and practices is in line with um, the intellect. It's not, it's not something that's parallel. It's something that works in connectedness to the brain. Um, and if we use the, the arguments that these scholars have come up with to align Islamic knowledge um, to the intellect at that particular time in, in youth, I'm thinking of it more in terms of life over the lifespan, how development changes. And during the time and ages which with, with, at which the heart becomes more mature, to appeal then with information regarding the heart. I'm, I'm, not, too, I'm not sure if I'm making a lot of sense, but um, just a reflection and your thoughts on it, um, brothers. Jazakallah khair. Yeah. Thank you very Jazakallah. much. Uh, yeah. uh, I think um, you definitely have brought up a very important point. And um, and we could see even from uh, Munkis Minandalala, Imam Al Ghazali uses mathematics as one of the tools uh, to to show uh, the limitedness of the intellect or even an intellectual and rational arguments. So he uses mathematics, and we know mathematics in the modern world, right, is something which is very rational and very data driven, right? With that, so definitely the intellect is is one of the methodology which Imam Al-Ghazali was, will talk about from page 5 to 8. Well, from page 5 to 8. Uh, but the other thing that, that uh, was is, um, uh, still, I'm still looking for an answer and still puzzled me, or uh, I have an hypothesis for it, is that how Imam Al-Ghazali uh, uh, performs that critical thinking within the rootedness of an ontological reality that he is able to recognize taqlidats which are doctrinal, which are fundamental, okay, which you do not question, versus seemingly doctrine purposes, seemingly doctrine practices that comes into the religion, but these are culturally influenced. Is there a relationship between how he grew up when he was young, the kind of education that he, he received, the environment that he was in when he was in Tours, as he grows in his educational development, the, 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 the developmental psychology of a child and the things and exposure that he has, does that provide the rootedness in order for him to be able to perform that kind of critical thinking within an ontological reality of Islam. Uh, that's that, that, that's one. And if we look at it also again from the other one, that's why the question number five is the role of jurisprudential psychology. How, it, how does uh, jurisprudential psychology nurtures children in preparing them for the adolescence, in preparing them to take on that journey of engaging in intellectual gymnastics, <coughs> if we would like to say, critical thinking and creative thinking in discovering what awaits them. Mm -hmm. these, are, these, are more, these are more questions that I'm still looking for answers, right? Okay. For us to be able to... to uh, us to be able to really understand the relationship between uh, psychology of children before bulu or before before reaching the the, the age of uh, kalaf to the age of balil and then its development after that 
Allah Rasulullah. But I definitely agree that the, the intellectual part is definitely there. As how Imam Ghazali will demonstrate in page five to page eight as we read through. Thank you so Brother much. Salam alaikum. Brother Jamaat, yeah. Salam alaikum. Salam. Darin. Salam alaikum, Professor Darin. Can I try to answer this question? Yes, of course, Professor Darin. Please yeah. go ahead. Okay. Yes. Let me just yes. introduce Professor Darin uh, briefly, please. We have such ex Professor Darin, Dr. Mubarak is a close colleague of ours, close teacher from Turkey, one of the experts in Imam Ghazali as well. We used to have a halaqa with him. Professor Darin, welcome. Jazakallah khair, brother. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm honored to have you with uh, us. Go ahead. Yeah. Brother, my modest uh, answer to this question is that uh, Imam Al-Ghazali is really a great psychologist. He is always trying to explain the psychology of everything. For example, when we read Sabr, when we read, uh, you know, Ghadab Kitab, Ghadab Al Hikt, always teaching us how to control our emotions psychologically. Even when we read the worship, for example, like Asrar Salat, Asrar Saum, when he says Asrar, that means psychology, in my opinion. But mm -hmm. the uh, problem is, I don't think Imam Ghazali is addressing children. Mm -hmm. He's addressing the adults. Mm -hmm. How can we make our children, uh, you know, uh, learn these things, but the adults has the job of psychologizing, psychologizing these difficult things, you know? So for example, he says, if you, are, if you have children, don't let them, uh, uh, you know, uh, get accustomed to luxuries of life, soft bed, uh, you know, uh, plenty of food. He always tells us, you know, we should uh, prepare them for difficulties. You know, uh, maybe not having a very soft uh, bed, not having too much food because too much food will, you know, uh, spoil the child. So uh, I, I am not also sure that uh, does he really address children? I think that's a new concept, you know, new pedagogical things are mostly uh, directly uh, addressing the children, but Imam Ghazali is addressing uh, mostly, you know, uh, adults, parents, and of course it's our job, uh, but this normal psychology he's teaching, especially how to control emotions, uh, I think we can benefit from him in a very vast manner, but of course uh, making, uh, diluting these uh, heavy concepts, uh, you know, for children's uh, if I am not wrong, Sister Kerry York uh, from uh, United States, she has this uh, Al Karam Institute. Maybe brother, you heard about it. They are preparing Ghazali books, Ghazali children's books. Uh, brother, did you hear about it? Yep. Yes. Yes. They, yes. Actually, yeah. Yeah. Please go ahead, Doctor Mubarak. Please. So Sorry. what I will say, we can make it uh, useful for uh, women, for men, for different classes of people. Even for non-Muslims, you know, because there are parts he is also dealing uh, with. The, for example, when he deals with the jealousy, he said, "If you are a Muslim, you can't be jealous of another Muslim because then you are rejecting God's plan, which is uh, it makes sense to a Muslim." But he says, "If you," he doesn't say this, but we can understand that if you are not a Muslim or if you are not a good practicing Muslim, then when you get angry uh, with or jealous of your brother, then you make your enemy happy. So, you know, if your enemy heard about you being jealous and being disturbed with your uh, with his emotions, he will celebrate it, you know. Look at me, I made my enemy angry and sad. So why are you making your enemy happy? So he's asking this question in the chapter of jealousy. Mm -hmm. So I think it's our job as uh, modern readers, dear brothers, sisters, to make him uh, more modern uh, for children, for women, for uh, working class, for all kinds of people, you know. Thank you, brother. Jazakallah khairan. Thank you very much, bro, for the insight. Yeah, definitely, we know that he is addressing uh, the adults, right? Uh, Imam Ghazali is not addressing children in his writings. Uh, but my 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 amazement, right, to this um, to the introduction of the of the monkeys when he was writing is that his uh, his ability at the young age to be able to discriminate. Or to be able to make the distinctions between the taqlidats, right, that are essentials in religion, versus those taqlidats which are more cultural and has the possibility of lending itself into falsehood, 
that I think definitely probably has an impact comes from right the uh the exposure and the education and whatever environment that he was in when he was a child that enables him to do that. And when we look at our youth at the present moment, they are having this identity crisis is also probably has a link all right, to how what they were exposed to when they were young, how the family institution, how the community, and probably the most and all those responsible for the education of children all right, needs to play a role in order to prepare our youth all right, in meeting up the challenge as they grow. So this is something that, that, that uh, Allah Rasulullah all right, that um, uh, amazed me uh, on how if we want to look at psychology of youth, we also need to look at the psychology of children, how the respective components of the human being develops as the age grows so that we prepare them for the youth. Because however, Imam Al-Ghazali somehow is prepared when he was when he met with this crisis that he had. Right? Uh, he was prepared in order to be able to overcome it as how we will see later in chapter 1. Allah Rasulullah. Thank you very much, Prof, for that insight. Uh, Dr. Mubarak, uh, yes, just please. a brief reflection and then I'll there's another question in the chat and also in the hand. And you decide when we will move forward to the next slide. Uh, for all brothers and sisters, Doctor. by the way, Professor Darin, thank you so much for your excellent insight. It's such an honor to have you with us, mashallah, um, as our teacher as well. This is the book that uh, Professor um, Darin was alluding to. Uh, so they are doing children's, and it's actually Fons Vitea, which is a book publishing house based in the U.S., we're translating a lot of the Imam Ghazali's work for children, by the way. Very good books, actually. I recommend them. So I just wanted to allude to the books that Professor Darin was alluding to. I just had a one reflection, and then we will add the others in the, in the chat as well, and also uh, those who raised their hands. Alluding to what Professor Darin said, and also what our beloved brother, Dr. Mubarak, said, I was thinking about... Um, the difficulties yet the, the opportunities when it comes to uh, parenting, actually. And um, in all honestly, there are two reflections from my side. And it's connected to some of these questions in this chat. One is, there is an uh, African proverb that says, it takes a village to raise a child. All right. We need more collective learning. You know, our traditional societies, the brothers and sisters, and many of our societies yet today are traditional. But modernity disconnected. For what modernity did with patenting, they institutionalized it, which is a problem today because the institutionalization of patenting that we see in kindergartens today is disconnecting our children from the fitra in many ways because the ideologies that are normalized there is not the ontological reality that Imam Ghazali is referring to. We can see that. It's a lot of other ideologies that is actually taking our children astray. So we need to revive at least in West, I'm speaking from my position living in Sweden, okay? I'm not speaking from a position if somebody of you live in, let's say in Saudi Arabia or Iran or Turkey, maybe it's different, right? Or Nigeria. Um, I'm speaking from the disposition of living in a, in a secular country, all right? It takes a village to raise a child. So in a sense, we need to bring back that collective aspect of learning and that village should be rooted in the utopia that we're seeking for, which is to be a Ummah oriented utopia, which has Tawheed at his paradigm as the essence of the ontological reality. And then we can start to work on this. So I would like to add the collective efforts, you know, of all of us raising children together in the village, for instance. The second aspect is that when we speak about intellect, we tend to also, because we're so modernized in our view, subconsciously think that the intellect is in the brain. But the intellect is not only in the aql. It is partially in the aql, but it's also in your aql. It is also in your soul, in your ruh. It's also in your chest, in your body. Our body has an intellect. So in daily, in early age, we need to work holistically with terbiyah from the aspect of what Imam Ghazali is you know, alluding to. So that we don't think that it's only mathematics or it's only anything that will awoke our children to think rationally. That is the essence of learning. We should use that and utilize that, but the agal is in our body as well. The agal is in our heart as well. 
to bring that about. So Professor Malik Badri, rahimullah, the father of contemporary Islamic psychology, and also we, at, we even though he's not with us here physically, he's always with us, you know, in the other realm. So we call him the founder of the ISIP, by the way. <laughs> he actually, uh, from, um, from the stories of his wife, Dr. Fatima Abdullah, she mentioned that the way that Professor Badri believed in Tarbiya and in children's education was with love compassion, to utilize the word of the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine name of Rahm, to utilize that, that insight, to not be too harsh on the children, but yet not to be too loose, because the Western narrative is today, the children, after they're, you know, come to the age of taklif, they should decide themselves, no, that's not the reality either, <laughs> we have Sharia, you know, we have Allah there, but at the same time, not to be too forceful either, it's this balance, which is very difficult. And I want to bring that also because when we are listening and reading Imam Ghazali, we need to also stay up, put ourselves in this contemporary era, which both Dr. Mubarak and Professor Darin is alluding to. Just some thoughts from my side. So Dr. Mubarak, there is one question. There are two hmm. questions and uh, there are two digital hands raised and there are two questions in the chat. Would you like me to go through them and then go forward? You decide and I will I think, hold uh, Just take the two questions from the raised hands. All right. Okay. Uh, we don't need to maybe just listen to their comments and then after that we will move on to read first so that we can okay, finish sure. up whatever that we uh because as I mentioned at the beginning, we are not here to answer all questions, right? It's a discussion. We will raise more issues and open up hopefully more areas of research that all of us are able to get ourselves involved in each other. Inshallah. We look forward to that, inshallah. Yeah. We will work together with that. There is, okay, I will let the, there is just here, Sister Lubna, uh, Dr. Mubarak, he is, she is asking, I, uh, she wants to know the psychology that we you referred to in the chat, if we can write it. She says, I mean the psychology that informs about child psychology before they reach adolescence. So did you refer to any psychology in particular then? No, I didn't, right? No, I don't think so either. Yeah, I didn't. That would be probably, you know, child psychology, Sister Lubna. I'm just like, it's a very conventional word, but I don't, I, if we are looking from the psychological, or probably, develop, you know, ch children and developmental psychology, perhaps, from in modern word, words. Allah alam, Allah alam. Mm -hmm. um, and then Muhammad al-Rashid, can we say that Professor Suleiman means he, Imam Ghazali, advises the adults on methods of taqlid to become true Islamic mentors? Well, that way I guess Professor can answer himself. Professor <laughs> Dari, would you like to answer that briefly? Yes, yeah. Professor Dari yeah. is around. Yeah. Professor Dari, are you with us? Maybe Professor Dari is not with us. Yeah. Allah alam. Uh, yeah, Professor Dari, you are with us. If you can unmute yourself. All right, we go back to that question, Brother Muhammad, yeah, later, yeah. inshallah. We will go back. The two virtual yeah, hands, uh, you want to just give them yeah, We take the hands. Yeah, let's take yeah. the hands and we go through the chat also. So yeah. we go first with Sister Ismat Fatima, please. Briefly. Uh, yes, Ustad. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, yeah. Jazakumullah khair. Actually, I wanted to reflect upon the first question. Um, uh, what is the identity that Imam, uh, Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, was searching in his youth? So probably he has, uh, when uh, Ustad uh, was explaining about how he um, said about the ilm al-yaqeen, how he said about the ilm al-yaqeen that should be rooted in the youth, that develops the youth intellectually and in every domain. So I think it was, it's really, it, it has really opened a very, uh, very uh, important idea for me to look where I studied about Imam Ghazali Rahimullah has said that there are three levels of knowledge, Ilm al yaqeen Ayn al yaqeen and then Haqq al yaqeen So I was trying to reflect on this and this is literally a gateway. If the Ilm al yaqeen is in the, is in the uh, youth, then uh, rooted in the youth, then he is eventually open to the next uh, high levels. And uh, the next thing was, is that identity universal to all the youths or particularly to Imam Ghazali Rahimullah? Definitely, this is, uh, this is absolutely very uh, important for every youth and it can be identified. But what we are losing today in the world today is that we have made different worldviews. One we believe is an Islamic worldview and one we believe as a secular worldview. If a child is sent to a school, he is sent to uh, study science, philosophy, humanities, laws, finances, and et cetera, et cetera. But uh, when it comes to um, Islamic sciences or Quranic sciences, he's sent to an another school. 
or he's rather neglected in that domain. So I think this is one of the limitations that we are doing when it comes to the period of Imam Ghazali, rahimahullah. This was not the limitation of those times of scholars. They never studied Islamic sciences as one uh, worldview, and they never studied the worldly sciences or the secular sciences or the modern philosophies or sciences as a different subject. So I think this is one of the limitations of today's youth that are, they are being studied two in a two different ways, which shouldn't be done. And to reach this higher level of knowledge with ilm al-yaqeen, I think two of these domains have to come together. And then that will be a space where we actually reflect upon the uh, sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reflecting upon and tadabbur and tafakkur would be more easier for us when we bring together the real sciences with Quranic sciences and study them. So that's my reflection, I think. Jazakallah khair for listening. MashaAllah, beautiful reflections. Beautiful. Thank you, Sister Smash. Beautiful. So, Sister Seba, please go ahead. Um, Salaamu Alaikum again to everyone. My, um, my reflection is very much in line with um, what the sister just, um, just spoke about and um, what Dr. Mubarak was saying with regards to the environment, because um, alhamdulillah, I had the opportunity to study throughout my life in Islamic schools. So where they have the secular curriculum in um, taking place together with the Islamic curriculum. And having been exposed to that environment, I think it, it gets you to start on asking more important and more fundamental questions a lot earlier than um, my peers who were studying in schools that were, were not of, were in a more secular nature. So I do think the environment is key in how soon you start asking those questions, mm -hmm. um, the fundamental questions about life and about the deen and about Islam and about Allah. So um, yes, I do think the environment is, is very, very important in terms of how you then proceed as an adult and how you respond and with regards to the to um the books that the professor was mentioning about the fonts with books i've started using the children's books with my own children and i think one part of um development that is not paid as much attention to in traditional madrasas at the moment is that they do teach about fiqh and aqaid and um, all the sciences of Islam, but the information in terms of how the emotive part of Islam about the heart and um, about the connection and relationship with Allah, these things are somewhat paid less attention to in more traditional madrasas at the moment. And I think that's where Ghazali's work and um, the work that the people at Fons Vitae are doing to, to transmit that, to be able to speak to children is of a lot of importance. Um, Jazakallah Rahay for listening. Sister, for your excellent insight. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you for both sisters, Smith and Sister Seba. All right, there is some questions in the chat. We will, uh, we will come back to them. Uh, yeah, we'll come back Sister Vin, Sister Seda. I mean, there are just, some of just reflection. I can just read one. Biological, cognitive, affective, social, interpersonal, social, institutional, and cultural play an all around influence for youth through adulthood to have stable Islamic characteristics. Yes. Yes, sister. Totally true. And then Sister Seda says, science has become the new religion. Science is essential, but not the answer. Yes. Science is important, but it should be integrated with the metaphysicality, with the metaphysicality which is also the, the position of Imam Ghazali as well. All right, we will go through more questions later, dear sisters and brothers. Please forgive us for any shortcomings. All right. Yes, uh, Dr. Brother Mubarak, feel free. All right, okay. Now, let us now read the text from page five to page eight. You want to share the book, uh, uh, Dr. Mubarak? Or, yeah. Do you have any volunteers who wants to read? Any volunteers? Raise your hands, please, volunteers. This is also the tradition of halaqa that the students read. All right, we have Sister, who, who do we have? MashaAllah, Sister Ismat. Or, yeah, she we wants share to, right. read the book, of the book, all right, for us to follow through, for those who do not have it. Okay. All right, Fadal, Fadalin. Go ahead, Sister Ismat. Feel free to unmute yourself. Jazakallah khair. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. 
uh, the principles of sophistry and the repudi repudiation of the sciences. My next step was to conduct a thorough review of my sciences, and I found myself devoid of any knowledge characterized by this attribute of certainty, except in the realms of sensory perceptions and logical necessities. I said, now, after the advent of despair, there is no incentive to tackle problems except among the plain facts, they being sensory perceptions and logical necessities. There is no alternative to checking them first of all. In order to verify my confidence in perceptible objects, and my security from error in relation to, in relate, okay. There is no, con there is no, con where are you, Okay, there is no, there is no alternative to checking them, first of all, in order to verify my confidence in perceptible objects and my security from the error in relation to logical necessities. Is my, sense of uh, is my sense of security based on conventional assumptions as it is used to be and on theoretical ideas as it, as it, is, as it is with most people or it is an indubitable security in which there is no delusion and no peril. I therefore made a serenish, okay, I'm sorry for my English. No worries, strenuous effort strenuous effort to reflect on perceptible objects and logical necessities and to see whether it, it was possible to make myself doubtful about them. After a lengthy process of spectacle review, I finally concluded that it was also impermissible for me to accept security in relation to perceptible objects. This doubt reached the point where it said, what is the source of confidence in perceptible objects? when the strongest sense of perception is the faculty of sight. That faculty looks at the shadow and sees it standing still, immobile. So it decides to a negation of movement. Then after a while, it learns by experience and observation that the shadow was in fact mobile and that it did not move suddenly, but gradually in minute stages. So it was never in the state of stand standstill. It looks at, it looks at the star and sees it small, the size of a gold coin, but then geometrical ev evidence pro proves that it is actually bigger than the earth. On this and similar perceptible objects, the judge of the sensory perception passes his judgment and the judge of the minds refutes him and proves him false with the refutation that can, be, that can by no means be contradicted. This led, to, this led me to say, Confidence in perceptible objects has also been invalidated. So perhaps there is no confidence except in those, there is no confidence except in except in those mental concepts that are among the basic exomes, like our saying 10 is more than three, and negotiation and affirmation cannot be combined in a single thing. And a single thing cannot be both recent and ancient, existent and non-existent, necessary and inconceivable. The judge of perceptible objects then said, how can you be sure that your confidence in mental concepts is not like your confidence in perceptible objects? You used to have confidence in me, but the judge of the mind came and repudiated me. But for the judge of the mind, you would have persisted in believing me. Perhaps there is another judge beyond the discernment of the mind. If he appeared, the mind would be proven false in its judgment, just as the judge of the mind appeared and the sensory perception was proven false. The non-appearance of that discernment does not prove its impossibility. The self, took, the self took a little while to find a response to that and it reinforced its ambiguity by raising the subject of sleep. It said, do I not see you believing certain things in dreams and imagining certain situations? You believe them firmly and strongly and you don't doubt them while in the state. Then you wake up and you realize that all your imaginings and beliefs were without foundation and to no avail. How can you be sure, therefore, that anything you believe in the wakefulness with your senses or your mind has any truth aside from the condition you are in at that time? 
You may suddenly experience a state which in relation to your wakefulness is like your wakefulness in relation to your sleep. And your wakefulness is asleep by comparison therewith. When the condition arrives, you will know for certain that all those things you imagine in your mind are mere fantasies with no substance to them. Perhaps that state is what the Sufis claim to be their spiritual state. Since they maintain that, the states peculiar to them when they plunge within themselves and, and pass beyond their physical senses. They experience conditions that are not in conformity with, with these mental concepts. Perhaps that state is death. Since Allah's Messenger وسلم, once said, human beings are asleep and when they die, they awaken. Perhaps the life of this world is asleep by comparison with the hereafter. So when someone dies, things appear to him as different from what he now beholds. When, the, when that time comes, he will be told, we, remi we have removed from you your coverings. And so today, your sight is piercing. When these notions occurred to me and I felt inwardly disturbed, I tried to find a remedy for that. But it was not an easy matter, since there was no cure for it except by means of proof. Such proofs could be only established by mastering the fundamental sciences. For if they were not mastered, it was impossible to arrange the evidence. This sickness has become chronic and it lasted for nearly two months, during, during which I applied the method of sophistry by, by virtue of my state, not by virtue of articulate speech and discussion until Allah, exalted he is, had cured me for that sickness. I was then restored to health and equilibrium and the mental necessities were once again accepted and relayed upon with a sense of security and centritude. That was not achieved by arranging a proof and preparing an argument, but rather by the means of the light of Allah, light that Allah, exalted he is, sheds in the breast. That light is a key to most forms of true knowledge. If anyone supposes that disclosure depends on formulated proofs, he has narrowed the broad mercy of Allah, exalted he is. When Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked about expansion and its meaning in his saying, exalted he is. Whoever it is, whoever it is Allah's will to guide, he expands to his breast to Islam. He said, it is a light that Allah sheds in the heart. Someone asked, what and what is its token? To this, he replied, withdrawal from the adobe of delusion and reversion to the adobe of eternal life. He was speaking of this when he said, peace be upon him, Allah exalted he is, created the creatures in darkness, then he sprayed his light upon them. It is from the light that disclosure must be sought, that light streams forth from the divine generosity at certain times, and it is necessary to be on the lookout for it. As he said, peace be upon him. Your Lord has sweet breeze to blow in the days of your lifetime. You must therefore be attentively prepared for them. The purpose of this quotation is that the seeker should strive with the perfect endeavor in the quest until he reaches the point of seeking no, seeking what is not to be sought. That is because the fundamentals are not sought for they are present. And if what is present is sought, it is lost and concealed. If someone does seek what is not to be sought, he, sought, he should be suspected for shortcomings in the quest for what is to be sought. Thank you very much, sister. Okay. okay, so now, after reading this part, right, of the, uh, of the monkeys, right, that was a beautiful reading from our sister, thank you very much. All right, um, a few, a few, a few things that Imam Al-Ghazali has uh, give, right, some, some few questions. Let me stop the sharing and I go back to my slides. Hmm. 
Okay. So these are some of the things that he has brought up, right? Uh, number one is the nature of the Lazalian doubts. Shuck. Right? So down here, the doubts that he has mentioned is not worse worse as how I have described last week. In the last, the last lesson, right? it is about shuck. And what is the role of shuck? And then he talks about the debate between sense perception and the intellect. And then Imam Al-Ghazali uses the use of analogy to demonstrate the existence of a higher cognitive faculty as compared to the rational faculty. That analogy he used was the analogy of dream. Okay, so dream right, was an analogy that he used right, to demonstrate to Imam Al-Ghazali, to demonstrate to the young Imam Al-Ghazali. Please have that in mind. It was the young Imam Al-Ghazali right, before the age of 20 who was going through this two months of uncertainty, imbalance, mental health condition, whatever you want to call it, that he was not able to find certainty. He was in uh, doubt inside himself okay, about the, 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 the knowledge that he already has okay, and then trying to find back that equilibrium. So it is that debate that is happening in the young Al-Ghazali not the matured Al-Ghazali. Not the Al-Ghazali who was already in Nizamiya, who was a professor in fact, <coughs> or the Al-Ghazali who has gone through that spiritual uh, seclusion for 10 years and then went back to teaching. No, it was the Ghazali which is at a prime age of youth that was undergoing that debate between the sense perception and the intellect. The use of analogy, all right, in trying to demonstrate the existence of a higher cognitive faculty. Not the usage of that higher cognitive faculty, but to acknowledge that there is something which is higher than what you know right now. Because that young Al-Ghazali was not an ordinary young person. That young Al-Ghazali was a brilliant young Al-Ghazali. Was already an intellectual. Was already mastering a lot of the intellectual sciences of his time. Okay? So in terms, if you want to put it, Right from the context of modern time. Basically, his mind is one of the brightest minds that you can ever find during that period of time among the youths, probably in the university or whatever it is. That Al-Ghazali. Then the inner tussle that was happening inside that Al-Ghazali between the rational faculty and the higher cognitive faculty that happens for two months. Right, That tussle that is happening. That brilliant Imam Al-Ghazali that has mastered many sciences of his time. Okay, many sciences of his time. He was already at Nishapur, learning with Imam al haramain al-Juwaini at that period of time, mastering the sciences of his time above his colleagues, above all the other students around him, having that tussle in him, trying to acknowledge this higher cognitive faculty. Now, this is Al-Ghazali. Right? This is Al-Ghazali who is rooted in Islamic doctrines. Yeah, who is rooted in Islamic doctrine. Then he mentioned about this method of sophistry that he uses when the tussle that was happening. And it restored him back to the state of equilibrium. But that state of equilibrium that was restored to him, he says, was not through the uh, method of putting in all the rational proofs, but through the light that shines towards the heart, that brings him back and restores him back to that state of equilibrium. These are the ideas that Imam Ghazali is bringing out, describing his life when he was a young boy. Not a young boy, a youth. Right? That prime age of youth, being one of the best students, being one of the brightest minds, Right, the Islamic civilization or the brightest mind in Nishapur at a particular point of time as a student of Imam al haramain al Juwain. Okay. So I pause here for a while for us to absorb this because remember when we read, we need to read it in context to what he is describing. That is very important. Right, that's, why I, uh, that's why we have couched it and framed it from the perspective of youth psychology to understand him. Be putting him as that model of what is your psychology all about because one of the pinnacles, hopefully when we understand that, we can understand all the other ranks which are lower than him. 
right? which is not going to be, be too difficult for us to understand uh, if we have understood right? Imam Al-Ghazali from that perspective. Allah Rasulullah Alam. Right? Now, uh, I, I open up for, for, for discussions, for reflections for anyone okay, on these particular points. Okay, only some 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 things that I would like to just point out, especially because the translation here, and if you were to read the other two translation by Montgomery Ward and Matt Carter, the the the, the English translation, they are they are quite they are different, right? In terms of the language that is being used, uh, the language that is used. So here, the the term logical necessities. And the term logical necessities is basically the, the translation of the Ruriyat, right? The first principles, right? The first principles. The perceptible, the sensory perception, right? Uh, basically, it's your sense perception, right? The perceptible things are the object where the senses are able to study, right? So that is what it means down there. Now, skeptical review, okay? If, if I could just uh, go back to the to the text so that I point to you all where are the necessary Arabic terminologies that we need to know properly. Are you all seeing the, the, the text? Yes, brother. Yes, sir. Eh? Okay. All right. Now on page five. Okay, on page five. Yeah. Okay, you see this logical sequence. So the logical necessities, right? These logical necessities, right? Uh, these are daruriyats. Okay? Daruriyat is a technical terminology that is used within philosophy, right? The first principles, okay? The daruriyats. The conventional assumptions, okay? Here is your taqlidiyats, right? Theoretical ideas, these are nazariyats. So these are technical terms that are used within all right, Islamic intellectual tradition in the area of philosophy, theology, logic, and mantik, and all this. Okay, indubitable security here is muhakkam, muhakik. Right? Okay, skeptical doubt is shak. Okay, skeptical review here. This is shak. All right. Uh, basic axioms. These basic axioms. These akaliyats. Yeah, these are Akaliyats. Okay. Um, mind here is a translation for Akal. Right? Mind here is the translation for Akal. Okay. Then the term sophistry that is used. The term sophistry that is being used here. The method of sophistry. Okay. This is a. Um, Soft self thought is that I mean, is sophistry or you know, rhetorics within the Greek philosophy. But how is sophistry understood at the time of Imam Abu Hamid al Ghazali? Yeah, is it defined as how is it defined now if you type sophistry in our dictionary? Yeah, so, this is also very important for us to, to know that because he said, I applied the method of sophistry by virtue of my state. State A is hal. Right, not by virtue of articulate speech and discussion. So, if it's of history, we will look. The history is more about rhetorics. Rhetoric is about about arranging your arguments, right? Arranging your proof. But here he's saying that by virtue of my state, not by virtue of articulate speech and discussion. And so, this is also an important right point that uh, we, we we need to know. Now, Dr. when Mokra, this, may, I, may I just say something? Yeah, sure. is a, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Um, a lot of the brothers and sisters are asking for uh, the Arabic terminology is written. So if we do like this, uh, Dr. Mubarak will provide later for us. Uh, we'll write the message and we will, it will be shared in the WhatsApp group for the Salafa. Okay, dear brothers and sisters. So we will do it in the WhatsApp group. We will uh, give you, uh, with your permission, Dr. Mubarak, if no, that's right. fine. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Yeah. And just yeah. also for those, there are some questions about sophistry. So sophistry, as Dr. Mubarak alluded to, was uh, uh, perhaps a rhetorical technique that was used during the Greek, in the Greek, you know, civilization, where people used like, you know, uh, you know, good arguments, but with false uh, uh, connotations. So it was like deceiving, but with like, Deceiving with like good arguments or you know compelling arguments. Uh, besides for this sophistry, probably I would also like 
uh, Professor Deriri if you have time the next time also to, to help us understand how the idea of sophistry uh, is, has been understood during the time of Imam al how, yeah, how he, how he, Because he is using this term within a text that is of his time answering a question that was asked to him. So how was that term understood? Because he's writing it and when, when, when those reading it at his time would have understood what he meant. So we need to understand how that term is understood, how that science was understood and used during the time of Imam Al-Ghazali before we can really understand this sentence that he mentions down here. Okay? All right. So that would be some. And these notions here, right? this is khawatir. Yeah? So it's a term, huh? it's a translation for khawatir. All right? So, it's quite a lot to offer us to absorb. Okay? Mm -hmm. all right? Within these few pages, all right, the amount of things that he brought in for us. Okay? How the sense perception, all right, how the intellect comes in, that, that discussion that you were having between the sense perception and the intellect, and then the, in, then the sense perception all right, bringing in that the idea that probably there is something else bringing infusing the doubts and using kiosk that was that that that, that uh, was this kiosk that makes it possible for the intellect to accept that is something which is higher but at that point of time when imam al ghazali was young at that young youth of al ghazali that faculty of the heart to understand deeper realities and certainty has yet to be developed it was only accepting that it exists. That's why he says it is not by, it's not, I came back to the equilibrium, not by putting in the logical argument, but it's through the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that came to me. Now that two months that he was in this state, this method of sophistry is the one that is debating and having that tussle in him. Now, we bring it to our youths who are having identity crisis, who are looking for akar for things, with all the things that is happening, what are the kind of processes that are, they are going through inside them, in their hearts, in their mind, in order to be at the equilibrium. And what is this, at, what is this equilibrium state? This equilibrium state is not the state where you reject knowledge coming from sense perception, where you reject knowledge coming from the akal, but knowing the boundaries of each one of these cognitive faculties. Where is the realm of operation of sense perception? To what level is truth can be attached to sense perception? To what level of truth can the logical mind, the akal gives you? And then you have another one which is higher, okay? which at that age, he was not yet able to understand through the logical mind. It has to come in through a chaos. All right, and that chaos that came in also gave him that tussle. Whether is it there? Is it not there? Is it there? Is it not there? Can I really accept it or not? Because I have a very strong mind. I am one of the best minds of that time. Okay? That's right for for Imam, not me lah, Imam Ghazali lah. Okay, all right. So that's this. This is that whole picture that is painted in this all right section. So all right. Uh, well, we can take one or two comments, inshallah. Then after that, I will conclude for today's session. I felt the uh, Dr. Mubarak, brother, I felt his fluctuating in my heart now. I was like trying to embody his state there, you know, like it's almost like the naps is pendling, right? Because the naps pendles from serenity and, and with Maina to, you know, uh, Amara and, you know, inclined to very nafsani behavior inclination. So I just felt it in my, subhanAllah. What in a, a two months is quite a short time, but for him that two months must, must been a lot of time you know because he used to be so active before he went into that as he referred to crisis so those two months brothers and sisters might for him like was like you know years you know imagine being so active and then suddenly come to the state of starting to doubting subhanallah thank you dr mubarak so we have uh, one digital one digital hand raised so sister aya feel free to unmute yourself Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakum wa kulla khayyab. Dr. Mubarak and Brother Jamal al-Din for this amazing halaqa. Um, the readings and uh, Dr. Mubarak's explanation was very profound. 
Uh, I have a reflection. I just and and a question at the same time. Um, uh, Imam Ghazali's crisis, as he oh. as he uh, called it, um, reminded me somehow of uh, Prophet Ibrahim salam, when he was searching with the stars and the moon and the sun and trying to find the truth. And um, I'm not sure how similar both journeys are because um, Imam Ghazali had, had um, his setup was different because he had, he like uh, Dr. Mubarak was saying, he was taught by Imam al Haramain, uh, Imam al Haram, um, as I, if I if I um, understand correctly, like he had a lot of um, elements and tools to reach the truth um, earlier, or or to reach the equilibrium earlier. Um, Subhanallah. So all this it makes me more empathetic with our youth today, who have layers and layers of noise and distractions and um, 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 things um, that are taking them away from the truth. It's just Subhanallah because I was dealing with youth differently. Like, how dare you ask these questions? How? Why are you so lost? Why? And but but Imam Imam Ghazali's crisis right now, Subhanallah, makes me think of youth in in a more empathetic way. Um, and um, as a inshallah, psychotherapist or a psychologist, I need this layer of empathy, and I'm grateful for this knowledge and ilm that you guys are, yeah, are are uh, circulating. Mashallah, tabarakallah, jazakumullah. Mashallah. Thank you very much for the reflection. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Subhanallah, that's so true. By the way, I mean, we're very harsh towards uh, yep. this new generation in the sense. That, all generations are harsh to the new generation. I remember when we were younger, they, my, our parents said, oh, this generation, they're not uh, as you're us. Right. You know? Actually, and, yeah, you're right. Actually, you're right. They the same thing. <laughs> and, you know, and the next generation does the same thing. But what you brought, Sister Aya, is compassion to the generation. Because it is a difficult generation. I was just thinking the other day, let me just bring some humor to the, to the place. I'm a Liverpool fan. Okay, I love football. And I'm actually very sad because we lost yesterday. But we won against Manchester United 7-0. And I always say to <laughs> Muslims who vote to Manchester United, they have shaitan on their emblems. So you don't vote to them. <laughs> you know, I'm joking now. But it is true. They have shaitan on their emblem, by the way. But never that. I digress. But what I really felt is like... Um, so I have one interest is Liverpool. And then suddenly I see the youth. They're checking like thousands of channels on their TikTok. And on their, they have so much input. It's too much. How are you supposed to filter all that noise? I mean, even my parents used to say to me, you guys have too much inputs. And we had perhaps five channels on TV <laughs> when I was a young kid. And, you know, alhamdulillah, I, I, I'm becoming old now. So alhamdulillah. But, you know, and that's a compassionate way of us approaching. Yes, our children are, you know, it's a difficult times. And sometimes, you know, we might be right that the generation is perhaps a little bit too loose, Allah alam, you know, but at the same time, their challenges are totally different than ours. A lot of ideologies today in this generation that are normalized was not normalized in my generation or in Dr. Mubarak generation or in Sister Aya generation. So what you brought, Sister Aya, to the discussion is compassion. We need to be compassionate with the new generation. And that's what Professor Bedri said when he was through Dr. Fatima, Dr. Fatima as his uh, messenger in that situation, do it with your heart. Do the tarbiyah with your heart. So we do reflect, but we have our heart in place as well. Allah Hu'ala. Jazakallah khairan, Sister Aya. Uh, we have, um, yeah, we, we're almost done for today. Uh, I'm just going through the chat, the Dr. Mubarak, with your permission. To see if we are, so the terminologies will be explained by Dr. Mubarak. We will share them in the WhatsApp group. With your permission, Dr. Mubarak, just the terminologies we went through today. And we will share them. No, no, and please join the WhatsApp group, uh, Sister Ismat or Sister Sema. Can you share the WhatsApp group again for all of you who are not part of the discussion group? And brothers and sisters, you guys have so much good discussions. After the first session, the WhatsApp group was dead. So please engage in the WhatsApp group because you guys have a lot of knowledge. And by knowledge inquiry, collectively, we learn from each other. And this is also part of halaqa, the circle. Continue the circle online, please. So, Sister Aya, 
I will give you, I'm, I'm passing the torch to you. You start with a reflection in the WhatsApp group. Mashallah, you have so many excellent Inshallah. reflections. Yeah, and Inshallah. then everybody reflect together, please. So we keep this, even though it's once a month, this could be every day we are reflecting on this. Inshallah. This is just some Nasiya. So let's see here. Um, Dr. Sima uh, says, SubhanAllah, Imam Ghazali is expressing about the states. We go in after intense feelings and our doubts about what we know at the intellectual level. Yes. Um, let me see what more we can find here. Prophet Ibrahim was granted the maqam of yaqeen when Allah showed him his ayat after pondering and thinking and looking for answers. My thoughts? Yes, good thoughts. Uh, sometimes husbands are harsh to wives and other wives are harsh to husbands. And we all need to turn compassionate and empathetic. Yes. Yeah. This is good for marriage counseling, Sister Seema, by the way. <laughs> I work as a marriage counselor. That's a very, And it's a good reminder for all of us. MashaAllah. A millennial Muslimah, mashallah, millennial Muslimah. So you're representing the generation, the new generation, mashallah, beautiful name. It's such an important reflection, also a very important point regarding the limits of faculties like nafs, aql, qalb. Where does one end and the other begin? Subhanallah. This is very important to understand, especially in Islamic psychology implementation. What do you think about that, Dr. Mubarak? Where does it end and begin? It's an interesting question and reflection. I do not know where it ends and where it begins. There will be there will be overlaps. That's definitely there will definitely be overlaps of the sense perception with the intellect, the intellect with the cult. To really delineate where it ends, I have I have to read more and have to find more. Can't really tell at the moment where it ends. And in my like small that, amount of knowledge, and I don't, I'm, I'm just a student, so uh, the, you, it feels you, like there's interconnection like yeah, you know, with them all as well. Yeah. You know, so. because although that's not someone was raising the thing that uh, uh, this, yeah, on uh, Elmul Yakin, Ainul Yakin, and Hakul Yakin, right? Uh, yeah. We could also look at it from this chapter, from this chapter. We start from Ainul Yakin first, then Al Mul Yakin. Because Ainul Yakin is the using of the sense perceptions. That is knowledge that is coming from the sense perception at that point. Then the logic comes in. Okay. Once you reach there, you go, if you go, then you go to the next part of the Ainul Yakin. So the first Ainul Yakin and the second Ainul Yakin are different Ainul Yakins. Right? The first Ainul Yakin is the sense perceptions. Right, you have to have certainty from right the knowledge and the information and the facts that we get from our sense perception because that is the tool that we have in this world. This world is a world of perceptions. So that kind of the, the our perceptions are still true to what it has been created for. Then it goes on to the El Mulyakin, that's how it's been talked about, right, in terms of the uncle. Then it moves on to the next level of Ainul Yakin before it moves on to Hakkul Yakin and some goes to Kamalul Yakin. So these are the, the, the various certainties that you can look at and where it can start and where it ends. Wallahu Rasulullah. Right, Dr. So, Mubarak, this is beautiful. You know what we should do, Dr. Mubarak? We can do an infographics of this. We have an infographic team in ISIP. Let's I'm, I honestly say we should do like infographics to explain this. We will get back to you, Dr. Mubarak. Yeah. We will have Sister Ismad, you're part of the infographics team and ISAP. Put this in mind, because you were the one who raised this, Sister Ismat, by the way, so it will be great. All right, dear brothers and sisters, we're mindful of the time. We need to conclude. Um, so Sister Saida Samia wrote, can we say knowledge or certainty starts with sensory perception to intellect to wahi? Yeah, we definitely have to start with sensory perception, because we are living in this world. Yeah. Yeah, All we right. are living in this world. We have to start from sensory perception. But of course, our sensory perception is not guided by wahi too. Right? So where do we start? From one perspective, we start from sensory perception. But and from another perspective, we start from wahi. Because wahi is through taklid. We Because we trust the Prophet ﷺ. When it comes to taklid and taklidat, there is one assumption. And it's a very key assumption. That the person or the source of where we get the taklid, the taklidat, is a trusted source. So therefore, the Prophet Muhammad is that trusted source that we have. And that comes from Wahi. So that can be the so for one perspective, it starts from Wahi, from another perspective, it starts from sense perception. So we are not for Islam, we are why we are called Ummatan Wasatan, 
because we don't pendulum we don't swing to what to the to either ends of the pendulum we are always wasap we are in the middle all right of this all right whether it starts here or it starts there well it starts from both sides because you can look at it from different perspectives mashallah mashallah barakallahu feekum brother with that said dear brothers and sisters we need to conclude sister sab i see that your uh, hands are raised i'm so sorry sister it's alhamdulillah we, we will continue for one. let me conclude yes. that the holding okay Oh, yeah, 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 of course, of yeah, course. Okay. Let's go ahead. So, Sister Saba, we will go back to your question next time, inshallah. I see that your hands is raised. So, inshallah, next time we will go, inshallah. Yeah, does you have a short reflection or you can wait till the next time? Or Sister Saba, if you have a short reflection, if not, we will take um, a minute. I just wanted to um, direct everyone to a book uh, by David Robinson. It's called The Expectation Effect. So he's a doctor in psychology and he explains on the limitedness of perception, of sense perception, and how you can utilize that um, in a way to redire redirect your thinking. And as a result of redirecting that thinking, um, you can have positive effects in your life. But what 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 my reflection was with relation to this book is the limitedness of sense perception and how it can be manipulated. And by giving too much weight to the sense perception and disregarding um, a wahi and the heart and um, all the other perceptions that exist in the human being, how you open yourself up to the game of shaitan because he can manipulate your he can manipulate sense perception and how we believe based on on that perception so i just wanted to direct to that book i'll share the i'll share it in the whatsapp in the whatsapp group inshallah thank you for directing I'll share it in the whatsapp group yeah, let me just uh okay i mean it's not homework but if you want to do a homework i would love you to go and try and to 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 view all right probably some of you all have view the Alchemy of Happiness, Al Ghazali, on YouTube, right? This is a documentary produced by Shah Abdul Hakim Murad, PJ Winter. All right? It's a one hour and 20 minutes documentary on the life of Imam Muhammad Al Ghazali. All right? And then we can see that whole documentary of his life and have those points that I have mentioned as a reflection and these three questions here, right? The internal and external factors, the in, uh, how they are relevant to our contemporary time, and how can we benefit from this crucial period with Imam Ghazali's life in understanding the psychology of you. So as you are watching this video, all right, think through these questions. Now, last two, all right, two further readings. If you are looking for further readings on shak, all right, the role of shak, the role of doubts within Islamic epistemology, uh, within Islam intellectual uh, tradition, you can go to Tawhid and Science, the book by Prof. Osman Bakar, chapter number three, where he explains Right, the role of doubts in epistemology based on Munkith Minad Dalala. Right? Or then you can go look into doubt in Islamic law by Intisal Arab, right? a professor at Harvard University right? for, uh, in, in Islamic law. Right? So that's all for me today, inshallah. All right? As I mentioned, we don't have a lot of answers. We only raise more questions for all of us because we are in this right, uh, sohba and this discussion together and we bring in our respective uh, expertise in this area in order for us to be able to contribute to humanity as the servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as the khadam of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I pass over back to Brother Jamaluddin. Khairan, Dr. Mubarak, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and all your knowledge and expertise. It's such a joy to listen and learn from you and such a joy to read with you and, to, and I want to also thank uh, all of our participants today for all of your excellent reflections and questions both in the zoom chat and also when you unmuted yourself barakallahu fiki and barakallahu fikum and barakallahu fik to all of you uh, and also i want to thank sister sema our uh, task, task force facilitator for this halaqa for her amazing uh, secretary and administrative work barakallahu fiki sister i want to thank sister isma also for her excellent work as our secretary we will share uh, once more. We will share the link uh, to the YouTube link of uh, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad's lecture. Inshallah, we will share that as well. So I will ask Sister Ismat or Sister Sema to find it on YouTube and share it in the WhatsApp group, please. We will also, uh, your PowerPoint presentations, uh, we can also share them, inshallah, in the yes, WhatsApp group. So, so Sister Sema will share it in the WhatsApp group, inshallah, and email it out if necessary. 
Uh, further questions, discussions, please use the uh, WhatsApp group, please. So Sister A already, she has promised us to start the discussion, inshallah, and then pass the torch to other members. And finally, we will meet next month again, and the reading and all the lectures and the reading and reading tasks the next time is in the welcome package that you all have access to. If you want to have access to it, we will share it in the WhatsApp group and email it out again. There you can have all the questions. Now, due to copyright issues, we're not allowed to share the book. But the book is very easy to find. Let's say like that, okay? So that's up to you, but we cannot share it, inshallah. You can either buy it or you can find it in some way online, I'm sure. All right, dear brothers and sisters, it's an honor to be with all of you. Thank Dr. Mubarak. Please round of digital applause to our beloved brother, Dr. Mubarak, for giving us out of his precious time. Jazakallah khairan, dear brother. And thank you to Professor Darin as well for blessing us today with your presence. Professor Darin is one of the leading scholars in in the field of Islamic psychology and also very much a leading expert in Imam Ghazali. And inshallah, we will meet next month, inshallah, and we will continue the journey. Uh, and this is not only a journey through Imam Ghazali, it's a journey within ourselves because the macrocosmos is in the microcosmos, which is your own system. So let's embody, let's reflect, let's do tafakkur, let's do tadabur, let's do muraqaba to understand reflections within ourselves, inshallah. Barakallah fikum, everybody. I wish you all a great continuation of the day. And from my side, please forgive me for any shortcomings from my side as your host and brother. And I'm very honored to be part of this and learning of all of you. And of course, from our beloved brother, Dr. Mubarak. Barakallah fikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Would you like to end with a closing dua, Dr. Mubarak? اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنحتري لولا أن حدان الله سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر صلى الله على خير خلق سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, everyone. Continue the conversation in the WhatsApp group. Thank you, Dr. Mubarak, my brother. Take care. Extend my greetings to your family. Have a great night, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Always honor. Thank you so much. For all of you, we have a lecture in ISIP in 17 minutes with Imam Dawood Walid from the US about sacred activism. So feel free to join us. We will share information on other groups. With your permission, we will end the chat now and end the Zoom. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.